been on this series of messages on uh, the five choices that uh, shape our lives. Now, the, uh, the reason you're laughing is I'm not good at math. And we have no idea how many this is. This may be like the eighth or, or the ninth or something like that. But these are the five choices that shape our life. And I'm sticking to it. <laughs> That's my story. I'm not changing it. Um, but as I've gotten into this, I've just found, oh, wow, there's another choice. This really shapes our life. And then think, okay, that does it. And then, no, no, there's, there's another one. And, another, and pretty soon we go, uh, you know, there's a lot of choices in our life. That as we go along. And, and what we do with those choices is hugely important in terms of what happens in our life, how we respond to people around us, how we respond to the Lord, uh, how we respond to the needs around us. And uh, today, I want to talk about one that um, is not something that, that comes natural for me. Most of these haven't been, I realize. But um, the more I thought about it, and the more I prayed about it, looking at this week, I realized um, this may be one of the biggest choices that we make that affects how we live, and perhaps it affects the most what people say about us at our funeral. <laughs> um, and this is the choice to be a generous person. I think that that's not something we're raised with. I think it's not something we're born with. I think that it's something that happens in us and hopefully by God's grace in us that we begin to stop grasping, holding, protecting, and we begin to uh, live freely. And uh, I, I said that this is what will affect what they say about you at your funeral because um, my, my mother uh, was a very eccentric person. We would call her wacky. I would anyway, not anybody else. They would call her Mrs. Westfall, but um, <laughs> uh, very eccentric and very um, impulsive. And yet the one thing that virtually everyone said at her memorial service was she was one of the most generous people that I'd ever met. And, I, and when she passed away um, a few years ago, uh, this month, um, she, uh, I got a, an email from someone who said, I was on a trip, uh, I think through Europe, and I ran into your mother or something, and I said, what a beautiful necklace you're wearing. That is just the most beautiful necklace. And the next thing I know, she took it off and put it around my neck and gave it to me and refused to take it back. And um, no one's ever done that to me before. It was only because she thought, um, you really love that? Well, here, you should have this. And, um, and I thought, well, she obviously didn't think ahead about that and plan that, and that wasn't part of a strategy. It just doesn't matter, you know, just bless people. And, and hearing things like that, I thought, wow, I obviously didn't get that genetic trait, but maybe I could make some choices in my life and start choosing to be a generous person. And, so I began to study the scripture about it, and, um, you know, I went to the, some of the obvious verses, like, you know, uh, God loves a cheerful giver, you know, <laughs> which means, really, the way I think, God hates grumpy givers. <laughs> if you think about that, if you're a grumpy giver and you're, and you're crappy about it, God doesn't love you. Isn't that weird to think? Because he only loves the cheerful ones. And I thought, man, I better, if I'm grumpy, I better not give. You know, <laughs> I got away with that for a few years, yes. <laughs> and, then, and then the Lord said, John, that's not the excuse so that you don't give. It's the change the grumpy side and, and start um, being cheerful when you're giving. Now, I, uh, I found a passage of scripture that I want to share with you. And it's in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Uh, beginning in first uh, Tim, it actually this whole chapter six is all about how we handle money. So I'm not going to get into all of that. But um, beginning in chapter six, first Tim, the love of money. You've all heard this, right? Is a root of all kinds of evil. Money is not the root of evil, by the way. What is it? The love, the love of money is a, a root of all of a lot of evil. Okay, so. Um, some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and stabbed themselves with many griefs. 
Isn't that a weird phrase? Like, um, but you flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you were made when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses and in the sight of God who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pilate made a good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus, which God will bring about in his own time. Verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but command them to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do, I never thought of preaching as commanding, you know, but um, it's okay. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds and to be generous, there's that word, be generous and willing to share. In this way they lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Now I want us to focus on that uh, verse uh, 18, be generous and willing to share. Why is that so important? Well, so I was doing some uh, word studies from the, the Greek text of this passage this week, and I learned something this week that I have never seen in all the times I've, I've maybe preached on this passage or, or read uh, through these verses and thought about these things. I, I learned something this week. And that is, this is the kind of thing that excites pastors. You may not care, but um, it, it really got me really fired up. So let's uh, you know how my mind works. Okay, be generous and willing to share. And, and I, I looked at that phrase and discovered that the Greek word that's used is willing to share. I never associated with this before. <coughs> Koinonikos. Have you ever heard that phrase koinonia? What does that mean? The fellowship. When the Holy Spirit brings people together they begin to share in a way that doesn't normally happen in life. It's not an expected way. It's not just, you know, donuts after church. That, you know, we think that's fellowship. That's not, you know, it's, it's the, the bonding and the bringing together of who we are and, the, and that we begin to share emotionally, personally, with our resources, with our time, with our creativity, with our prayer, we begin to share our lives. That's koinonia. And, and I never saw that that is the, a, a, a version of that word that's used here in describing uh, be generous and willing to share. That actually this generosity and, and this propensity to, to open our lives and share with others, that, that this is actually the foundation of who we are as a church. That is like the root of it. Because without uh, the koinonikos, we're just a bunch of people getting together. You know, we might as well be Kiwanis or Rotary or something like that. Uh, you know, daughters of the American Revolution. Now, you know, I'm not against clubs. I'm a member of the Society of Mayflower Descendants. Is that cool? Lifetime member. And, uh, I've been to one meeting in my life, and boy, was it bad. <laughs> and I determined, you know, no more meetings, but I'll drop that every once in a while if I need <laughs> creds, you know. <laughs> so, not among my Native American friends. I don't tell them that, do I? But um, <laughs> we were the intruders. But, um, but the thing is, what separates an authentic fellowship of followers of Jesus from any other club what makes it different? Koinonikos. Koinonia. The, the, the willingness to share. The, the willingness to open up and be vulnerable and to, and to share. And, and that is not what we find 
understand? Because it requires the Holy Spirit to be alive and, and empowering us and releasing us because otherwise our natural inclinations are not to be sharing. Right? I was taught never share. Um, but that is the root. And I, I saw that and I went, oh my goodness, that changes everything for me here. Because there's no true fellowship where uh, there's an absence of generosity. Now, I've, I've been in a number of churches, you know, yeah, you may have been in them too. Maybe we've been in the same ones, where there's not a, a, a there is a real absence of generosity. There's a, an unwillingness to share. I believe there's no authentic church there. It's just a bunch of folks who show up at the same time on Sunday morning. Um, now, you know where my mind goes. What blocks Koinonikos? What is it that makes this difficult for us to experience? What is it that makes it such a rare thing uh, in our lives and in our community? Well, that got me thinking too. So, here we go. The first thing that blocks this, and this won't surprise you, it's fear. And a lot of times in my charts, you've seen this. We, it kind of starts with fear, doesn't it? Because so much of our uh, breaking away from what God wants for us begins with fear. And, and this fear uh, grips us. And particularly, you know, when it comes to our you know, generosity of, of our finances or our time or, or our creativity or whatever it is, and we... Um, we think, oh no, I'll lose what little I have. There won't be enough. Uh, what if it's not used the way I would have used it? What if it's, you know, what if, what if, what if, and, and the spirit takes over and we go, better hold back. And so then the spirit leads to, um, I'm gonna hold this. Um, we we uh, create uh, self-protection. You know how to spell that, so you don't need me to. Self-protection, right? <laughs> you don't get that. Um, looks like self-protestation, but that's a whole other thing, I guess. Um, but the self-protection is where we, we and it starts young, and we start building barriers between us and God to protect us. If we're afraid of God, we're afraid of what God might do. Well, we, we don't dare make a mistake, so we better hold everything back. Uh, remember the, the parable that Jesus told about the different people who were given uh, amounts of money and, and told to go do something with it while the master was away? Remember the, those parables? And, uh, and they come back and one of them had, made, had multiplied it geometrically and, and the master was thrilled and somebody else had multiplied it a little bit more, you know, and they were thrilled. And then they get to the last guy and he, and he said, um, here's the coin you gave me. Because I knew that you're tough, and I knew that you're hard, and I knew that you have high standards, and so I wrapped it in this cloth, and I have kept it safe, so here you go. And the master's response is, you are so unfaithful. Even if you knew I was hard, and you th even if you thought of that, why wouldn't you have done something with what I've given you? Why didn't you do something with it? Why just hold on to it? Well, it's fear. Don't want to make a mistake. I'm sorry to admit that with the kingdom assignment, I've got my hundred dollars the pastor gave me, and uh, I haven't found the right thing to do yet. Anybody identify with that? I'm waiting for the right idea, the really perfect one that I'll have something to close the service on Palm Sunday because I'll have the best idea ever. So I'm sitting with it, waiting. I hope the pastor doesn't get on me. So anyway, so what happens is we become self-protective. We hold back because we're afraid we don't want to loss, we don't want to be misunderstood, and all those things. Now this self-protection blocks. I may not get it back up again, but it blocks vulnerability. Which you know, in the family I grew up in, that would have been a good thing. <laughs> yeah, don't let the blummers hear us. But uh, they were the neighbors. But um. <laughs> 
It blocks vulnerability. We're not able to share. We're not able to open up. We're not able to be real and authentic with people because we have to be self-protective out of fear. It all links together. And so this vulnerability, which we all know is what? Giving other people the weapons that can hurt us. Right? We give them the weapon. We share the things that we go, wow, if you use this against me, that could do some serious tire damage. And, uh, and then we hope that because they love us, they won't use them. You know, there's not been any, uh, you know, <laughs> terrible thing happened to me in my ministry that wasn't because of something that I already shared. Nobody ever found out a secret about me because, you know, I have no unexpressed thoughts. And so um, <laughs> the, uh, the, all the accusations that have ever come my way over 35 years of ministry have been things I usually shared in a sermon. <laughs> it's like, well, I thought everybody knew that. Yeah, they did. Well, you know, it gets turned a little bit. But that's the, so we stop being vulnerable. We stop giving the weapons that can hurt us. And without vulnerability, sharing, koinonikos, is shut down. And when sharing is shut down, there is no fellowship. And I'll tell you what, this is a portrait of a lot of churches in our country. And this is a portrait of a lot of families. And this is a portrait of a lot of our lives inside. I never knew what a master painter I was, but this is it right here, this cycle. And I think we cannot be dragged down by this. We're only a few years old as a church. If, if we got into this cycle, might as well close the doors. Set up a donut stand, maybe, but, but, but we'd have to close the doors. So I thought, what in the world is going to break us out of this? How can we ever overcome such a powerful cycle of shutting down? Is there hope? <laughs> oh, good. Good thing. So, let's start at the top. What is it What is it that takes away our fear? What does the Bible say takes away our fear? Perfect love. Knowledge. Perfect love, not knowledge. <laughs> knowledge just makes us more scared because we know more. <laughs> love casts out all fear. It throws it out. It kicks it out of the place. So God's love breaks in and cancels out our fear, gives us the ability to overcome our fear, to live beyond our fear, right? Because, because we, re we recognize that we're loved. And when that happens, we have the freedom to begin to tear down the walls, the self-protection. Take them down. Now, you're not going to just kick them down. You're going to take them down one block at a time, probably, a little at a time, because, you know, we don't want to be totally caring and sharing and open. But with what we might start to take these self-protection walls, we'll start to say, you know, I don't need this so much. I was meeting with somebody this week, um, uh, consulting with them about something, asking for some help in, in my life. And, and we started, I started sharing a little background stuff, and he stops me and he says, I need to say right up front, that everything that's shared in this room between us is completely confidential and will never be shared. I'm only taking notes so I can remember this and put it in a file and it will never be brought out. You can share anything with me. I, I stopped at this little speech, you know. I uh, heard that before. And, uh, and I said, oh, no, 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 no. screw that. Uh, a, I know that stuff does get shared, but B, the only way I'm going to be healthy is to do it anyway. So it doesn't matter what your speech is. We're just going to, I'm going to tell you the story, you know, and, uh, and I hope down the road you'll tell me yours. And he, and he said, no one's ever said that to me before. I said, well, that's too bad. Because actually, that's far better that we just share than it is that you have 
a speech to give about how we'll never share this, you know. And the thing is, when the walls start coming down, then our vulnerability is not blocked, it's unleashed. We're actually free. And uh, do we always say good things, right things? No. Do we sometimes go, wow, maybe I shouldn't have shared that. Too much information. <laughs> you know, you know, get that, usually from a spouse. Uh, tell me later. You had to bring that up at dinner, did you? you know, I, not that that's ever happened in our home, you know, but uh, the vulnerability starts to flow for the first time. And when that happens, it's not just us, but sharing begins to unleash because people will become as vulnerable as we are with them. If we're closed off, if we're walled off, people will be walled off. If we want people to share, then we need to do it first. But oh, that's not safe. Darn right. It's not. And, uh, but we do it, and then the sharing starts to flow. And when the sharing flows, there is now true koinonikos fellowship. Now, what does this have to do with generosity? Everything. Because all of these things, fear, self-protection, lack of vulnerability, shutting down, no fellowship, all of that is what happens in us, in, in our finances, in our emotions, in our relationships, in our work situation, everywhere we go, we're not vulnerable in one area and walled off in another. Um, the reason that it's uh, so rare to find people who are, who are freely generous or it's so exciting when we do find them, is that it's rare because these things are usually not rewarded in most places in our life. If you were to go into work, to your work situation, and trust me, it's the same in my work situation. If you were to go into your office and begin to say, you know, I feel so loved today, I'm tearing down the walls. We're just going to knock them to the ground, and we're going to be vulnerable here. We're going to just share with your, you know, your tech team or whatever. You know, and, and we're just going to be sharing together. We're going to have real fellowship here. You know, the Lord's present today. <laughs> How will that be received? Maybe you need a break. Maybe we can get some HR people to meet with you. <laughs> Help you with your obvious problems. We're not rewarded for that. And I'll tell you, we're not rewarded in the church for that either. You know, 35 years I've been a pastor, and the more you become what the Bible says we should be, the less people like it. Isn't that weird? It's like, oh, we're not comfortable with that. Why? Because it means we may have to start doing it too. Because when one shares, then you share back. And then there's no stopping it. I, I, I remember calling my old boss, Bruce Larson, when I was down in um, Walnut Creek, and he was in, uh, uh, he was co-pastor at Crystal Cathedral at the time, and I called him up one day and said, oh, Bruce, I need to get some advice here. Um, this, I shouldn't say that. I don't know what, what, what church I was in. I forgot what it was. I don't know yet. <laughs> I go, people are so stingy here. You know, nobody's tithing, you know, they, 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 this and that, but... Uh, I said, it's, it's like nobody's unleashed. And uh, he said, well, I, I said, do you have any ideas maybe for a sermon I could preach that would really uncork this? An uncorking sermon. And he said, no. There is no sermon you can preach that would do that. There isn't one. Well, then what should I say? Should I start a committee and, you know, plan something? No, there's no committee that could do this. I go, well, then what do I do? He said, they're just going to be what you are. <laughs> so if, if you're tithing and you're sharing and you're generous and you're vulnerable, eventually they will too. Dang. <laughs> <laughs> I hate it when he's right. You know? We want a plan. There's no program here other than we just do this, right? We just do this, and God unleashes us. You know, I love the, uh, the, the parable of the prodigal father. 
You know, in Luke 15, let me see if I can find that here. Matthew, Mark, Olivia, Newton, John. That's an old guy's joke. <laughs> yeah, so you know, the prodigal son went off, squandered all the money, <laughs> eaten with the pigs, you know, kind of like my family thought I did, and uh, and then starts to come home, and the father, you know, runs out, gives him the jewelry, gives him the fashion hits, and puts on the big bash and the party, and and squanders everything. Uh, in celebration and love uh, for the son, right? That, that was greedy and rebellious and wrong. And, uh, you know, and then you, we get to that part about the older brother, right? and which in the Greek means Presbyterian. That's actually the word, Presbyteros. You know, I love that. Right? It doesn't mean anything in this church, but that used to mean something. Um, the older brother, sitting out in the field, he, he, he heard the music, he saw the dancing, So he knew what was going on, and he refused to come to the party. I'm not going in there. What a waste. This drawl I've done, you know. Um, the older brother was angry, refused to go in. The father went out and said, you know, look. Look at this. Come on in. No. No. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And I think, how many times have, has the Lord said to us, come to the party, come in. Uh, it's all for you. And we go, no. It's not the way I want it. I'm not going to do that. Um, we've got to get to the point in our lives where we can actually trust in Jesus. Where we can trust Jesus with our needs, with our emotions, with our histories, with our pain, with our struggle, with our money, with a, our friends, with our lives. And we say, Lord, I'm going to trust you in all of this. Not just with the religious part of my life. You know, I'm gonna, Lord, I'm going to trust you from like, you know, 9.30 to 11 on Sunday morning. That's, that's, I'm going to, that says, forget that. How about the rest of it? And, uh, and there's something about coming to grips with, are we going to actually trust in Jesus and allow him to totally change our lives, to reshape our lives with vulnerability and fellowship, true koinonikos and sharing and love instead of fear, we would be different people. So this week, um, Friday night, Eileen got the call that her mom was doing much worse from the care center. And, uh, you know, she may not make it through the night. She may, you know, who knows. And Eileen was planning on going down there in a couple of weeks. And all through the night, she was restless. She couldn't sleep. She was tossing and turning and tossing and turning. And the next morning, she said, I'm, I'm loading the car. I'm going to go down. I need to go down there. And, uh, and, um, and she said, the weirdest thing happened last night, John. And I went, oh, well, what's that? You know, we put down the paper, what? And, uh, <laughs> um, and so she said, um, I just I couldn't sleep all night. I kept waking up. I kept thinking about you know, my mom, wondering what's happening, figuring out how to get down there. And, um, and suddenly, into my mind came the words to the old hymn, uh, Tis so great to trust in Jesus. And she said, and the weird thing was, all the verses, like literally, right there in my mind. And I said, you know, I think we sang that Sunday, last Sunday in church. She went, we did? I don't remember that. And yet it was planted there in her mind. And she said, I just, I woke up this morning and I thought, you know, I can trust Jesus through this. And, and it's going to be all right, whatever happens. If I get down there, she's already died. If I get there, she hasn't died yet. Either way, it's, it's going to be all right, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust in Jesus, just like the song. And I thought, well, we have no idea what God is planting in our hearts and minds to prepare us for what we need down the road. Right? When you picked the song selections, Dave, last week, did, was that you were thinking of Eileen? And, uh, no, we just sang a song. And, uh, and yet, God takes those things and works them in us 
and uses them to unleash us, to set us free. So we don't have to worry, be afraid, grapple, struggle, fix. We can say, Lord, all right, here we are, we belong to you. Take us forward.